two. Okay. Just wait a second. Okay, great. The number is growing, which means that people are coming in. Okay, great. So I will introduce you now. Hi, everyone. Thank you for join, joining us on our webinar on the topic of the role of sleep in bipolar disorder. I am so excited to welcome today's host, Lampos Bistunis, who is a PhD student in the field Department of Clinical Neuroscience and the Department of Psych Psychiatry at the University of Oxford, researching the role of sleep and cir circadian rhythms in bipolar disorder. His work is funded by the UK Medical Research Council and is supervised by associate professors Simon Kyle and Kate Saunders and Professor Colin Espy. He is also a fellow of the Repro Reproductible Research Oxford, the local group of the UK Re Reproductibility Network. Lampros completed his BSc in psychology at the University of Glasgow and his MRES in clinical psychology, methodology, and statistics at the University of Amsterdam. Whenever you are ready, you can share your slides. Thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, Savannah, and thank you to everyone who's joining. Um, let me share my screen. Can you, can you see everything okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Then, yeah, so as Savannah said, my name is Lampros and I am a PhD student at the University of Oxford and I am looking at the role of sleep and circadian rhythms in bipolar disorder, which is also going to be the theme of my talk. Um, I want to preface this by saying that I do not work clinically at the moment, so everything in this presentation is derived by my appraisal of the research base and do not take it as clinical advice. Um, there is going to be room at the end of the talk for some questions, but if you don't feel comfortable to ask them in this forum, I have uh, right here my email and my Twitter, and um, I also have my page on Open Science Framework, so we're trying to make all our research um, openly available to everyone, so if you're looking for the manuscripts, data, analysis codes, everything should be there. So just to give an overview about the talk today, so I assume most of you should to an extent be um, kind of comfortable with what bipolar disorder is. So I'm gonna start the talk with an introduction on what sleep is and why is it important to look at it. Then I'm gonna move on to looking at sleep disruptions as symptoms of bipolar disorder, which is the most traditional way to look at them. And then move on to looking at them as risk factors preceding other bipolar disorder in, in its entirety or preceding episodes within bipolar disorder. Then I'm gonna move on to talk about sleep as a treatment target for therapeutic interventions. Then some of my, my ideas about what the future of research in this area could look like. And then um, we'll open the room for the discussion and the Q and A. So I'll start with an introduction to sleep. But before I do that, we need to introduce biological rhythms. So biological rhythms are periodic phenomena that oscillate, oscillate in specific temporal windows. So we have three broad categories. We have ultradian, circadian, and infradian rhythms. So ultradian rhythms have an oscillation that is less than 24 hours. So these are processes like breathing, blinking, your heart rate. So they extend from like seconds to kind of minutes to hours. Then we have circadian rhythms, which are processes that have a cycle of about 24 hours. And the most obvious one is sleep and wakefulness. But there's also processes like body temperature and digestion. And then finally, we have infradian rhythms, which are biological rhythms that have a cycle that is longer than 24 hours. So these are things like menstruation, hibernation, or migration. Um, 
as you can imagine, we're going to focus exclusively on circadian rhythms and within them sleep. So circadian rhythms have a genetic origin and are endogenous in nature. This means that they do not need uh, rhythmic input from the environment in order to oscillate. Um, but they are um, entrained by exogenous cues that's, that we call zeitgebers. And what entrainment is, is just a process of synchronization. So even if you are in a cave by yourself with no kind of access to the outside world, you would still have a 24 hour uh, sleep, and wake sleep and wake cycle, but it might not be in sync with the outside, kind of the outside world. Um, and the most important zeitgeber that we have is the light dark cycle. So we usually entrain our sleep and wakefulness to the available uh, light and darkness. But um, what do we actually define as sleep? So there's two kind of like broad definitions. The first one is the behavioral one, and it is what most of you imagine sleep to be. So in fancy research terms, we define be sleep behaviorally as a period of decreased consciousness, perceptual disengagement, physical quiescence, recumbent posture, and eye closing. But this definition is kind of what you would all imagine sleep to be. However, in the research, we very often um, care about the perception of other people about what is a sleep onset or wake onset, but we also care about the neurophysiological definition of sleep. So along those lines, sleep is broadly defined in two very distinct states non-rapid eye movement sleep and rapid eye movement sleep. So non-REM and REM sleep. Um, Non-REM sleep is further subdivided into um, three stages, non-REM one to non-REM three. And this kind of thing uh, show um, sleep death continuum. So um, N1 is kind of the lightest sleep stage with N3 being what we call deep sleep or slow wave sleep. Um, now, um, REM is very, very different to non-REM sleep. Uh, but it is also divided into the parasympathetically driven tonic REM sleep and the sympathetically driven phasic REM sleep. I'm not going to go into details about the differences between non-REM and REM sleep. Feel free to ask me if you want to, but not as, it's not as relevant to the talk. And in terms of the assessments, um, there's also kind of like two broad classifications. We have uh, self or clinician administered measures and lab measures. In terms of the self or clinician administered ones, there's clinical interviewing, which is when a clinician or researcher would just follow a structured or semi-structured interview guide to mainly look at specific sleep disorders. We have sleep diaries, which is exactly what you imagine them to be. We give people a diary and we ask them to kind of talk about the sleep, specific questions or open-ended questions about what time they woke up, went to bed, how many times they woke up, how sleepy they were before they fell asleep and after waking up. And we also use some standardized questionnaires. In terms of the lab measures, we have actigraphy, which is a measure of um, activity. Um, it's actually not exactly a measure of sleep. It measures rest and, acti uh, sorry, rest and activity. And it's basically like a least grade version of a Fitbit. Then we have the gold standard of sleep assessment, which is polysomnography. And polysomnography is a combination of different tests, with the most prominent one being an EEG an electroencephalogram, which is basically just a measure of the electrical activity of your brain. So we use that during sleep and just before you fall asleep and just after you wake up. Uh, but we also use several other channels to kind of quantify um, the activity during sleep, things like um, an electrocardiogram, kind of um, we look at muscle movements around your eyes, your chin, your limbs, uh, breathing patterns. Um, and then the two last ones is circadian phase test. So we use kind of hormonal tests to look at the circadian phase, your endogenous circadian phase, and the multiple sleep latency test, which is a test that is used to kind of uh, quantify sleepiness. I'm not going to talk about the last two. Um, in this talk, maybe a little bit about the circadian phase tests, but I just have them there so you know you have a coherent idea about what tests we have available. And why is sleep important? Um, so. I think we all have anecdotal evidence after a really bad night of sleep or a period of bad sleep that we might feel groggy, ill, tired. Um, but um, there's also a lot of research on this. And on the other side, you could also have periods when you're ill that you sleep a lot. And when you're tired, you can feel that your body actually needs a lot more sleep. 
So I have kind of like accumulated some areas that are important and related to sleep loss. So things like memory, concentration, mental health and mood regulation, immune system. Um, sleep deprivation has been linked to other things like um, kind of muscle tremors and aches, high blood pressure. It's been associated with other heart diseases, obesity, weight gain, type 2 diabetes, insulin regulation, um, and also other things like coordination, balance, and decreased sexual drive. We spend about a third of our lives of sleep, so it's no wonder that sleep is just so immensely important for so many processes. But as sleep scientists, uh, we are also interested in sleep disorders. So this is a group of very heterogeneous yet clinically distinct um, group of disorders that have a very specific clinical presentation, etiology, prognosis, and treatment needs. So the six broad categories plus the other sleep disorders. So we have insomnia, which is an inability to initiate or maintain sleep despite uh, the person wanting to sleep. And this typically leads to daytime impairments, central disorders of hypersomnolence. So these are uh, disorders that have to do with excessive sleepiness, sometimes also involuntary sleep episodes. Circadian phase disorder. So this is a group of disorders that have to do with alterations of your endogenous body clock or a misalignment between your bod endogenous body clock and the environment. Sleep-related breathing and movement disorders, which I'm not going to cover today and um, parasomnias. So parasomnias are abnormal sleep events um, um, that kind of have reached a clinical threshold to be called a disorder. So things like sleepwalking or nightmare disorder. So we see that sleep is immensely important for both physical and mental health, but why sleep specifically for bipolar disorder? So I'm gonna kind of begin this by um, kind of giving a historical perspective of how important sleep is in bipolar disorder. And I'm gonna start with a quote from Emil Kraplin. And uh, Emil Kraplin uh, is kind of one of the fathers of bipolar disorder. He's one of the first people that conceptualized and published what we now refer to as bipolar disorder. Um, we have evidence that um, people thought of bipolar disorder from ancient times, but this is kind of one of the first formal um, kind of like publications in this. And it was back when um, bipolar disorder was called manic depressive insanity. So Emil Kreplin, 100 years ago, said, the attacks of manic depressive insanity are invariably accompanied by all kinds of bodily changes, by far the most striking other disorders of sleep and general nourishment. In mania, sleep, sometimes there is even almost complete sleeplessness. And in the states of depression, in spite of great need for sleep, the patients lie for hours sleepless in bed, although even in bed they find no refreshment. So a hundred years after this, we have moved um, a lot in understanding of bipolar disorder, but sleep is still um, classified within the diagnostic criteria for bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder, what we know it is uh, basically the psychiatric disorder that is characterized by alterating states of hypomaniomania and depression with kind of in-between periods of uh, reduced symptomatology called euthymia. And according to the DSM-5, um, sleep is actually a diagnostic criterion for both hypomania and depression. In hypomania, we see decreased need for sleep. Uh, people might feel rested after just three hours. And in depression, we have insomnia, hypersomnia. Um, the similar um, criteria for the ICD-11, any other diagnostic manual. And in euthymia, even though initially we thought that the symptoms are very much reduced, if not absent, Kind of more recent formulations and understanding see that actually there is symptoms, but they might be in reduced intensity. And we also see that actually sleep is one of the most prevailing symptoms in euthymia. We see insomnia-like symptoms, like an inability to fall asleep accompanied by daytime dysfunction, but we also use, excuse me, see an increased use of hypnotics during this period. But what about concrete diagnosis, not just symptoms? Um, we see that um, 69 to 99% of people, sorry, this is about the prevalence, 69 to 99% of the people reported reduced need for sleep in hypomania, and 38% of them report symptoms of insomnia. Almost 100% of them report um, symptoms of insomnia in depression, and about 80% of them report symptoms of hypersomnia. So imagine this as increased sleepiness throughout the day and about 70% report uh, sleep problems in euthymia. 
And in terms of kind of concrete diagnosis, about 55% of uh, people in bipolar disorder, people that have bipolar disorder that uh, would warrant a diagnosis of insomnia, about a third of them would warrant a diagnosis of a circadian phase disorder. And the most common one here is a delayed uh, sleep phase disorder. So uh, this disorder presents with a very delayed need to fall asleep and a very delayed wake time. So very late at night, um, going to bed very late in the morning, waking up. And about 30% of people would warrant a diagnosis of hypersomnia. Um, and um, these are kind of like broad estimates, but our lab has actually done um, a lot of work trying to understand more fine-grained details about both the symptoms and the sleep disorders in um, bipolar disorder. And we do this, we did this recently using a massive kind of like survey in the UK that we call the UK Sleep Census. So the sleep census, the UK sleep census is a survey of more than 300,000 people in the UK. And what we did within this is we actually looked at people that uh, reported having received a diagnosis of bipolar disorder by a clinician. And there was just about over a thousand of them. There was 1,072 participants. And what we did is we matched two more groups to this group. So we looked at people that, report, that have reported that they've never received any mental health uh, diagnosis and people that have received the diagnosis of unipolar but not bipolar disorder. Well, unipolar depression but not bipolar disorder. And these groups are matched for age, gender, education, background, and current occupation, which means that at the end of the day, we resulted in three groups of just over 3,000 people that were very similar demographically. And what we saw was not surprising, is what we expected. We see that the bipolar disorders group shows, compared to the people that reported no mental health disorders, reported much higher insomnia scores, which is what you see on the top graph, a higher dissatisfaction with the sleep, shorter sleep duration, and a need for more hours of sleep. They also reported an evening chronotype, which is what you can see on the bottom part of the figure. Um, they also reported longer and more frequent napping, increased use of prescription medication for sleep, and more likely to have received psychotherapy for sleep problems. Now, this is the uh, um, kind of comparison between bipolar disorder and the control group. Uh, but the bipolar group actually did not differ in any of these items with the unipolar depression group. Um, and then moving on to more general um, items of mental health, uh, the bipolar disorder group compared to the control group um, had higher depression scores, which is the top figure, more frequent cognitive complaints, which is the middle figure, and reduced quality of life, which is the bottom figure. Um, and as I said, this is very expected. And what we actually found is that here, the only difference between the bipolar disorder and the unipolar depression group is a difference in the reporting of um, cognitive complaints with the bipolar disorder group reporting more frequent, more severe cognitive complaints. Um, there's obviously important caveats for this type of research, mainly it's uh, mainly the fact that it's self-reported and um, it's a survey. So um, ideally you would want to actually see these people confirm the um, bipolar depression, uh, sorry, the bipolar disorder um, and the unipolar depression diagnosis. Um, add more items, sleep diaries, um, polysonography, actigraphy. However, we traded this for the sake of having a kind of like a really big number of people. Um, and we can see that sleep is very prevalent, but sleep is also extremely important for this population. Um, sleep, has been, sleep problems in bipolar disorder have been linked to reduced quality of life, reduced cognitive functioning, increased suicidality. And for me, the most important one is that it's a domain that's extremely important for the patients and the carers and actually for the clinicians as well. Um, there's been a few very interesting um, studies recently that showed that sleep and functioning are the most kind of like important things for people and also things that still have circadian principles things like energy so when you ask people like what's the most important outcome for you to be studied they would say things like oh it's my activity or it's the like um, energy level that I feel throughout the day whether that's very high or very low um, and it's same for the carers the carers also reported kind of using sleep as a marker of how um, the person is feeling so I think it's extremely important to you know 
um, kind of like follow this line of thinking in the research as well. Um, what about the assessment of sleep? So um, most of the kind of like work that I mentioned before is you is kind of like done using global measures, so like questionnaires of sleep for sleep quality or insomnia or anything else. Um, in terms of lab lab based lab based measures, actigraphy shows what we thought it would show. So uh, we saw we see increased activity in mania hypomania, decreased activity uh, in depression with a lot of inter individual variability. So people having very variable intensity of their activity throughout the day, and in euthymia we see kind of symptoms similar to insomnia, like increased sleep latency, more awakenings throughout the night. What is interesting, though, is that the euthymia group is very is different to the insomnia group in the sense that the, the euthymia group actually shows increased um, sleep duration. That was the only uh, difference between the euthymia group and the insomnia groups. Um, now, pulse somnography, the problem is that there's very, very, very sparse evidence about pulse somnographic sleep markers in bipolar disorder. Um, the studies that are used to derive these findings are mainly old and have very small number of participants. Some of this is because, as I said, polysomnography is very expensive. It is very costly. It's extremely tiring for us to actually have to um, kind of like carry it out. Um, but it's also not easy for the participants, especially when that participant is already distressed to have them have, you know, maybe 25 electrodes all over the body. But what we know so far is that there's an increased sleep latency and, and REM sleep duration overall. In hypomania, reduced total sleep times is just very expected. Longer sleep onset latency in depression, which is a symptom that we typically see in, in insomnia. Um, but this is compared to both unipolar depression and control groups. We see decreased non-REM1 and non-REM2. And in euthymia, we still see a reduction of non-REM2 uh, an increased duration of the first REM episode, which is um, not as common. Typically, the first REM episode of the night is very short-lived, and also an increase in the total percentage of REM sleep. Um, in terms of the circadian phase test, I'm not going to uh, kind of go too much into detail, but they basically confirm the evening chronotype, which is what people in bipolar disorder typically um, report. And... Um, this kind of takes us to the next uh, chapter, which is kind of going beyond looking at sleep as just a symptom of bipolar disorder. So traditionally, people thought that uh, sleep problems just happen within bipolar disorder, that it's just part of the um, typical clinical presentation and most often a uh, consequence of impaired mood. However, more recent investigations have actually found that Sleep precipitates bipolar disorder overall, but also sometimes even precipitate episodes within bipolar disorder. Um, it's an extremely interesting kind of research area. Um, and it can help us a lot because it's very important to see if sleep can have a predictive or causal uh, relationship with bipolar disorder symptoms. So in terms of the timeline of where sleep and circadian disruptions present in bipolar disorder, I adapted this figure from an, an amazing paper by Pierre Zoffrey from uh, 2018 from Biological Psychiatry. Um, and this kind of like shows like the wide range of involvement of sleep problems in bipolar disorder. So we start off before the person is even born with kind of genetic predisposition to bipolar disorder that is related to sleep or circadian rhythms. And that takes the form of uh, molecular clock alterations. So alterations in genes that actually have to do with circadian rhythms. Another very interesting area that is actually very under-researched is uh, light signaling alterations. So there is some evidence to show that people with bipolar disorder might actually be hypersensitive to light. Now this can cause a range of uh, problems, but it can also mean that maybe we can use light therapeutically um, in bipolar disorder. And this is something that people have looked at and have done. And I'm gonna talk about this later. Now, the second phase is when a person is born, uh, many times we see bipolar circadian disruptions preceding minor or major mood episodes. So a person would be well and then move to reporting sleep problems before reporting any kind of problems with their mood. And this is something that we've been working on. 
Now, the next stage is kind of general circadian and sleep disruptions um, in bipolar disorders. So things like circadian rhythm dysregulation, sleep homeostasis disruptions, and monomnadic system alterations. Um, I'm not going to talk about this um, stage a lot because there is actually a talk within this series by Professor Michael McCarthy. Um, I don't remember the year, but if you go on the International Bipolar Foundation page, it is one of the talks that comes up when you look at circadian rhythms. But the final stage is um, sleep problems within bipolar disorder more formally. So we see sleep problems precipitating bipolar uh, episodes, so sleep problems before mania, hypomania, and before depression, but then obviously them existing within these episodes as symptoms, and then sleep problems obviously in um, euthymic phases. So now I'm going to take basically every stage one by one and talk about them, starting with genetic predisposition, and we're going to start with some animal models. So um, in this model by Roybal in 2007 was published in PNAS, and what they showed was that deletion of X19 of the circadian gene clock actually leads to um, dominant negative uh, clock proteins that, although um, are able to bind, they're unable to actually carry out transcription. And what this means in lay, in lay terms is that basically we took a circadian gene, it's in the regulated circadian rhythms, and make it virtually inactive. And what they actually showed in mice that carry this mutation is that they actually engage in mania-like activities. So what you can see on the top part of the figure is that um, these mice uh, would show increased dopamine levels, but um, they would also show behavioral patterns uh, similar to what we see in many in humans. So things like increased impulsivity, um, reward sensitivity, hyperactivity, uh, and decreased uh, sleep. And um, I mean, this was amazing to show on its own, but then the bottom figure shows that actually um, restoration of a functional clock gene or treatment using lithium in these uh, mice actually makes a lot of the symptoms dissipate. So kind of like um, kind of reducing the mania-like behaviors. Um, and throughout the years after this study, there's been also a lot of other um, kind of candidate gene, can circadian candidate genes that have been implicated in bipolar disorder. So things like the NPAS2, PER3, and many, many others. But in terms of uh, human models in genetic predisposition, this study by Neve Mullins was published recently in Nature Genetics, but it's basically a genome-wide association study of over 40,000 people with bipolar disorder. And what they've shown is that there's actually um, strong positive correlations between bipolar disorder and items regarding insomnia, sleep duration, daytime sleepiness, and morningness. And even beyond the genetic correlations, a study by O'Connor in 2021 showed actually quite high uh, polygenic genetic overlap between bipolar disorder and chronotype sleep duration and insomnia. In this kind of like study, the uh, polygenic overlap was about, I think 70 to 80% for all of them. So it's quite high. Um, and moving away from a lot of the kind of like genetic research, we'll look at the high risk and prodromal phases. So when someone is born, but before presenting with any kind of mood problems. And actually, I am in Toronto right now in Canada, working with some of our co uh, Canadian collaborators on this. Um, I'm actually working with Professor Anne Duffy, who uh, what they have done is they followed a group of um, people that have a parent with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder and have looked at them longitudinally uh, throughout many, many years. And um, what they have seen is actually that sleep problems is actually the demarcation point between kind of wellness and moving to kind of like presentation of other mood problems. Um, and it's very important to look at this population because bipolar disorder is highly heritable. The heritability estimate is 85% of bipolar disorder. So this is why we call this group of people that have a pattern with bipolar disorder high risk. And what they saw is that an insomnia diagnosis early on increases the likelihood of a future mood disorder arising by 1.6 fold. So we can see how important it could be to use early sleep problems in this high risk group as markers and uh, of kind of like um, 
as markers of kind of like future uh, pathology or future problems. And very important to give them the care that they might require. In another similar cohort, in uh, the BIOS cohort by uh, people at the University of Pittsburgh, they actually showed that within the same high risk group, um, people classified as poor sleepers were twice as likely to develop bipolar disorder in the future compared to the same high risk people in the same high risk group that were classified as good sleepers. And usually these classifications are very non-specific. And uh, some of the most specific markers that have people, people have looked at in these populations is things like increased energy levels, decreased need for sleep, evening chronotype, and ir irregularity of sleep patterns, and decreased social jet lag. Um, social jet lag is this like incredible marker of discrepancy between your sleep and activity rhythms between weekday and weekends. Um, basically meaning that, you know, um, if I prefer to wake up at 1 p.m., but obviously for work, I can't do that. And then so on the week, weekdays, I wake up at, say, 7 a.m., then I'm going to rebound a lot of this kind of needed sleep time and reverse back to my natural pattern on the weekends. It's a very interesting marker. But the work that we currently do with the Moody Center, um, Moody Soldier Centers for Ottawa is working with Professor um, Anne Duffy and our teams in Oxford to kind of have a very fine, grain definition of the sleep phenotype. So we're looking at people that are high risk, people that have a pattern with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, and that are also within the critical age of onset period in bipolar disorder, which is kind of between 15 and 25. And we're using um, questionnaires, sleep diaries, a lot of actigraphy measures to really quantify and see um, what we can tell in this population, what we can say in this population. Um, and then moving on to people that have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, we can see the involvement of sleeping episode relapse. So famously, Thomas uh, Ware in 1987 described sleep reduction as the final common pathway in the genesis of mania. And this kind of followed some early studies that saw that um, periods of sleep loss usually precede the onset of mania. And um, there was also some studies that showed that complete sleep deprivation, so one night of just no sleep, um, decreases uh, depression symptoms dramatically. It's one of the most effective ways to do that, but the problem is that it increases symptoms of mania and sometimes can even lead to the occurrence of a manic episode. So moving on from this, people retrospectively also classify sleep as an early symptom of mania. So for mania, they would say that sleep is the first thing that they notice in terms of the emergence of the mood episode. And for depression, it's kind of the sixth most frequent early symptom. So this is a retrospective um, research. Uh, but we also see that um, in um, kind of when major life event happens that typically are accompanied by sleep loss. So things like bereavement, childbirth, or very long transmedial travel, these episodes usually precede the onset of mania. So this is just some, not the highest, but some suggestive evidence that uh, sleep loss might be related to mania. Um, and then what the figure on the right shows is uh, a study by Kratu that was published in 2016, the General of Affective Disorders. And what they show is they actually followed people longitudinally, so sort of a, a long period of time. And what they showed is that um, people that were classified as poor sleepers actually spend more time in an episodic phase. So they would spend more time in hypomania, mania, or depression, or a mixed state, compared to good sleepers. But also, they had a much shorter relapse. So once the episode was kind of uh, gone and they entered euthymia, they would actually spend less, less time in euthymia and would have a relapse to a new episode uh, faster. So what we see from this, it's, it's incredibly important to A, assess sleep early on, especially in populations that are high risk, and offer these people, these people the treatment, the support that um, they might require. And also, it might be very, very interesting to look at, oh, well, it might be interesting to look at sleep within this euthymic period and assess sleep routine, routinely, because we can see that sleep actually persists, traditional care in bipolar disorder, and its existence in euthymia might actually predict shorter relapse and less favorable, less favorable outcomes in the future. And this actually directly takes us to 
uh, looking at sleep as a treatment target is the final part of the presentation. So um, in terms of pharmacological interventions, most uh, treatment manuals actually suggest uh, lithium as the first one of treatment, fluoxetine, or lanzapine, or um, quetiapine on its own as monotherapy for the treatment of bipolar disorder. And all of these, with the exception of fluoxetine, have um, strong circadian and sleep profiles or well, properties, and especially lithium. Lithium has by far the most interesting circadian profile of all of them. So lithium, um, evidence suggests that lithium has, lithium response has um, kind of like genetic origin. It's genetically determined. And circadian, molecular circadian markers and um, chronotype are actually predictive of this response. So what the studies at the bottom show by Michael McCarthy in 2018 is that on a behavioral level, people that show morningness or indicate a preference for morningness are baseline, so a favorable response to lithium. And what the figures on the right show is that um, the cells of lithium responsive individuals actually show a shorter circadian phase or um, can be shortened using lithium in vitro. However, people, cells from people that are non-lithium responsive um, have a, an extended circadian phase and are not very responsive to lithium in vitro. So despite knowing about the prevalence of sleep problems and their importance sleep um, and the importance of sleep in bipolar disorder, most manuals actually do not directly address sleep as an independent treatment target. So although these uh, medications have some sleep or circadian properties, the kind of like only way the sleep is actually discussed is by recommended, uh, recommending like GABA modulators for sedative purposes. So what our team did is, what our team did is um, look at medications that are actually specific for sleep. So we looked at melatonin and melatonin receptor agonists like uh, amelthion and agomelatin. And what we found is that there's actually not many kind of randomized controlled trials looking at this, but also the ones that do, do not actually show very strong um, effects for depression. There's some indication that they might be effective for mania, but the most striking finding is that despite the studies actually looking at a circadian kind of um, AIDS end or an AIDS end that is very directly related to the sleeper circadian system, they do not measure sleep or circadian rhythms at all. So we don't have much evidence about how effective they are at improving sleep. Um, typically, most studies would just look at mood. And then that takes us to behavioral and psychosocial interventions for sleep. So this is also some of the work um, that I have done. And according to this work, uh, there's kind of like um, these very broad interventions, um, behavioral and psychosocial interventions for sleep in bipolar disorder. We have bright light therapy. So people would typically have um, artificial light box and they would just be asked to kind of like look at it for a specific amount of time during the day. Interpersonal social rhythm therapy. I find this extremely interesting. It's basically the idea that we shouldn't just regulate the rhythmicity of your sleep, but other processes that follow um, kind of circadian or rhythmic patterns. This whole idea about social zeitgebers. So things like talking to people, eating, um, activity and stuff like that. Blue light blocking glasses, so exactly the opposite of the bright light therapy. So people would wear like orange tinted glasses during the evening. Cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is the first line of treatment for insomnia. So independent of a, of a secondary diagnosis uh, with primary insomnia, CBT for insomnia is the first line of treatment. So there's only been one study that has actually looked at this, but our group does plan to do uh, more work on this. So we are working on a study on this. Um, Total sleep deprivation, extremely interesting, but extremely controversial um, treatment um, in bipolar disorder. We talk, so usually the pattern would be kind of three days, um, not exactly consecutive, but within one week of complete sleep deprivation. And this would typically be administered in depression. Triple chronotherapy, which is kind of like a new adaptation of total sleep deprivation. It includes total sleep deprivation, um, bright light therapy in the morning and a component called phase advance. 
and then integrated family and individual therapy. So this is kind of a combination of family psychotherapy with interpersonal social rhythm therapy. So there's only one um, treatment guideline manual that recommends uh, sleep uh, behavioral psychosocial interventions, and it's the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists treatment guidelines for bipolar disorder. But this is also the most updated one that we have. So I think that a lot of it is because there was actually more evidence at that point to make these recommendations. So they do recommend the routine assessment of sleep and circadian rhythms in clinical practice. And they also recommend bright light therapy for bipolar depression and interpersonal and social rhythm therapy as a maintenance statement. So just using it more long-term and not in periods of kind of like acute distress. Um, and some work from our lab, we actually did a meta-analysis looking at um, randomized control trials of uh, these type of therapies. And we actually found that bright light therapy does produce kind of like strong effects, st strong antidepressant effects. We saw that the kind of bright light therapy group actually does better in depression compared to the control group that do not receive bright light therapy. A caveat here is that the, um, the findings are only based on six RCTs that have very kind of like, they typically have small number of participants and they also have very variable um, methodology. So it's not conclusive, but it's some very good suggestive evidence. But what are kind of like work found about kind of the rest of the treatments is that the evidence base for their effectiveness is kind of limited, um, which is not surprising. Um, I know that um, people are very excited about sleep now, but um, I would say that this type of area, this, this type of uh, research area is quite new. It's still in its infancy. Um, so uh, we don't have conclusive evidence about their effectiveness, but what we actually saw is that um, 63% of these studies do not formally assess sleep or circadian rhythms. So even though they deliver an intervention that is incredibly focused on sleep and circadian rhythms, they would typically just look at mood and maybe functioning, but not sleep. Um, I th this could be an after effect of just seeing sleep as a, a consequence of mood, so focusing on mood as a primary outcome. But um, it does not exactly reflect kind of, you know, updated understanding of how we perceive sleep and circadian rhythms now. 84% of them do not assess sleep at the baseline. So they do not recruit people that have a sleep problem. Now, seeing bipolar disorder with kind of like no sleep problem is quite rare. But still, when you have a study that is small, doesn't include many people, it's very important to have very good phenotyping. Um, the rest of the studies had not... Um, there were some problems with clinical stratification. Most of them look at acute episodes and mostly depression. And there's not a very big focus on BD1 and BD2 subtypes. So to conclude, my ideas about future directions, I've kind of divided them up in assessment and treatment. So for assessment, I think the sleep should be a primary outcome assessed in all bipolar disorder resets together with mood and functioning. So even in studies that do not look sleep specifically, sleep should be included as an outcome. Um, there should be robust and routine assessment of sleep. So very often I see studies kind of looking at sleep and they just extract one item from a depressing questionnaire. This is not a very robust assessment of sleep. And we also need to integrate sleep diaries, lab measures, and polysonography in our assessment. Um, so not just rely on questionnaires, although we do that because they're very easy to administer. Longitudinal assessments of sleep, so look at sleep uh, throughout a long period of time. Experimental studies on sleep loss to actually know a little more on the causality between call, um, sleep loss and mania, and the use of both sleep and circadian markers as outcomes. Um, so I know that try to make it seem like sleep and circadian rhythms are one and the same, but they're really not. Um, we have circadian research, sleep research that have different markers. Um, in terms of treatment, again, the inclusion of sleep as a mainstay outcome in intervention research. So if you deliver a sleep intervention or circadian intervention, we should be including sleeper circadian outcomes every single time. But even if it's not an intervention that specifically targets sleeper circadian rhythms, we know that it's a very important outcome for uh, patients. We need to include them. Phenotyping of sleep disruptions are baseline, so we can screen people and deliver uh, intervention to people that actually need it. Focus on well-designed randomized controlled trials. It's the our cities are very hard to do, very costly, uh, need a lot of time, but we need to move towards them in order to have more conclusive evidence 
and more confidence in the recommendations that we make. And another area that I think is very important, there's very little evidence on this, but there has been some research on, is creating tailored interventions for high-risk individuals that present with sleep or circadian disruptions. So people that are younger and people that are high risk of developing bipolar disorder, or any other mood disorder, but that at the start present with a sleep problem. Now, um, this is everything from me. I want to thank, um, obviously, the International Bipolar Foundation for inviting me, my supervisor, Simon, Kate and Colin, um, and Liz and our team in Canada, my funders and everyone, everyone, everyone in the SNI and the Department of Psychiatry, all the new members that have been my mentors, my friends, and have supported the work that we have done. So yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so much. And we will now transition to the question. So the first question was, what is your take on sleep tracking technology, like the rings you wear, Fitbits, mats that go under mattresses that measure the quality and quantity of sleep? Are they helpful in reflecting accurate data about sleep? Oh, <laughs> this is a very controversial question. So, um, so these type of trackers do not measure sleep. Um, in research, we call what they measure rest and activity. So, for example, what they do is they would just measure your activity pattern. So they would quantify sleep as the absence of activity. But for patient populations, a lot of the people that um, participate in our research, for example, might actually stay in bed for like four hours and just not be able to sleep. The a tracking device is never able to actually do that, to differentiate between immobile inactivity in bed versus sleep. So they're not very good on that. So if you're a person that has like a very healthy sleep pattern, then they're, they're gonna be more accurate. Um, I think some of the times it can be useful um, because they make you think about your sleep, but I wouldn't recommend people to be excessively preoccupied by the results that they give them. Also, a lot of these things are only validated in-house. So I do a lot of work on open science. Uh, so the availability of data publicly, and we don't have access to the algorithm. So I cannot know what algorithm Fitbit or Apple, what is used to like kind of like track activity. Um, I mean, this is standard for uh, a corporation, but I'm saying that we do not actually know what the algorithm is like. So use them if you want to, to think about your sleep a little more and um, your activity, especially if you do exercise, but I would not be too preoccupied um, about that. Okay, great. What are natural interventions or remedies are there for sleep disruptions? Oh, that's very interesting. And I keep trying to tell people that. So we have like bright light therapy, for example, right? But this is artificial light. It's so easy also to go out and natural light is also so much high intensity compared to artificial light. So um, a, a friend of mine in the group does some fantastic work on kind of light interventions. And instead of using artificial light to try to get people to be exposed to more natural light. So natural light in the morning um, um, is uh, would be very good, but especially for people in bipolar disorder, I think it's also very important to talk to your GP, your physician, your psychiatrist. And if you do have some sleep problems, um, to actually discuss them with them and actively uh, seek out treatment if you feel like you need it. Okay. If a clinician isn't currently assessing sleep through sleep diaries, is that something I, as a patient's caregiver, should initiate on my own? Oof, I don't want to give any clinical advice, um, uh, but I think that you should care about your sleep anyway. And if you feel like um, if you feel like you're facing some problems with your sleep, uh, make a note of them. It's very important to also know exactly what this problem is, um, and then I would move them to your physician. And if um, and um, if you're not kind of like happy with that assessment of how they're treating this, then um, ask them about this. Um, I don't know what the system is in the US, but um, there are kind of like sleep specialists that you could also see. Okay, great. 
in your studies, have you noticed any significant differences with sleep patterns within gender? Oh, um, not that I know of. Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. The interesting thing, though, is that it's actually important to look at people that have a bad partner and people that don't, because very often, especially for sleep, you have to tailor the intervention to both of them, right? Um, you can have a person kind of cutting out a sleep intervention if the person right next to me in the bed doesn't want to do it. So I wouldn't say gender. There might be some evidence. I'm just not aware of it. Um, but a bed partner, for example, is one that is um, very important. Okay, great. And last question. Do you recommend that people focus on the quality of their sleep or their quantity? If quality, how do you improve on getting more REM or deep sleep? Oh, um, so it's very weird. You just have to strike a balance between both. Um, and typically they would be related. Um, I think the problem is that very often we, um, I don't know, uh, we start to recommend people that they get eight hours and this is kind of the average that we would typically recommend or see for healthy sleep. But I think people should be preoccupied about getting exactly eight hours of sleep. So um, a behavior that we typically see in insomnia and other sleep disorders is what we call sleep preoccupation. So it would be, you know, looking at your phone, you say, okay, if I sleep right now, I will get eight hours. So I have to sleep now. And then you're not sleeping. And then you're, okay, okay. What about if I sleep right now? Right now, I would get seven and a half. And it doesn't happen. And then that leads in increased arousal and anxiety. Um, my supervisor, Colin, he's an incredible clinician, but he also always describes sleep as a, an automatic process that very often um, you just need to let it happen and a lot of the blockages is kind of your cognitive um kind of your cognitive ideas about how long you should be sleeping and also the effects on your day if you don't sleep um, so yeah think about your quality also think about your quantity but it's uh it doesn't help if you kind of you know think about it too much and then prohibit yourself from sleeping because you want it too much okay great well, that wraps up our questions today. Thank you everyone for joining us. We hope that you gained valuable information and thank you so much Lampros for joining us and sharing your insights with us. If you enjoyed our webinar, please let us know with your thoughts in the comments and make sure to check out our other videos on YouTube channel, which this webinar will be uploaded to so you don't miss any webinars in the future. Thank you everyone and we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.